Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Pitt Alumni Association for today's webinar. Graduates of the Great Recession share advice and encouragement with graduates of the Great Pandemic. My name is Marcy Johnson, and I'm the Director of Young Alumni and Student Programs for the Pitt Alumni Association. I want to thank Renee, Andre, Chad, and John for taking the time to be with us today. Just a uh, quick note is to please use the question and answer function for any questions you have throughout their presentation. And uh, we normally do introductions, but we're actually doing it a little bit differently. So I'm going to kick it over to our presenters as they will do their own introductions. Renee, why don't you start us off? Okay, Marcy, can you see me? Yes. You good? Okay, great. Well, hi everyone and welcome. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you all virtually. Uh, just a quick introduction on myself. As Marcy said, my name is Renee Stepnik and I am a 2009 graduate of the College of Business Administration. My major was in accounting and I am now a CPA and I work at Deloitte & Touche. Um, I'm in the audit and assurance practice as a senior manager. So what I do there are financial statement audits of public companies and larger private entities. Um, I think that's it initially for my introduction. I am a member of the Young Alumni Advisory Team. So if you have any questions about that too, feel free to, to let me know, but then I'm gonna pass it on to Andre. And if all the presenters can turn their videos on, we are ready. Fantastic. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Andre Burton. I am a uh, two-time uh, Pitt graduate, so I earned my undergraduate degree uh, in 2008 from the College of Arts and Sciences. I also have a master's degree in higher education management from the School of Education. Uh, currently, I am a major gift officer uh, at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., so I focus on raising uh, major gifts for our law school. And uh, that's uh, the intro for me. Thank Chad. you, Andre. Chad. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chad Eric Smith, and I am a graduate of Pitt, the class of 2008. Um, I am currently in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I work for the uh, uh, public arts program, Mural Arts Philadelphia, and the restorative justice department. I am also an award-winning uh, actor and filmmaker, and I'm also a native of Washington, D.C. Thank you, Chad. John? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is John Allen. Uh, I am from Pittsburgh. Went to Pitt, graduated in 2009 from the College of Business, uh, studied finance and economics, spent the next uh, about decade in New York, uh, worked for an investment bank for a few years, and then worked for a hedge fund for about seven years. And then I spent the last two years in Philadelphia. Uh, I attended the Wharton School at Penn for my MBA, and I actually just returned to Pittsburgh. Uh, so I'll be starting with Boston Consulting Group in a few months, uh, where I'll be doing strategy and management consulting. Great. Thank you so much. We will kick it off with the first question. So what was the biggest impact that the Great Recession of 2008 and 2010 had on your experience? Did you take a gap year? Did you pursue a career different from your degree? Or um, did you go to grad school? So in the same order, Renee, if you want to kick us off, please. Yeah, sure. So um, whenever I was at Pitt, I had started my career with Deloitte by doing an internship in between my junior and senior year. So that would have been the uh, summer of 2008. And then my senior year, um, starting out, I was lucky I had a job offer with Deloitte. So went in feeling pretty confident. And then as the fall came around and the recession hit in the fall of 08, you know, there was a ton of uncertainty with whether or not I, I would still have that offer. Um, and in March of 09, Deloitte had announced significant layoffs and headcount reductions to which um, I'd say the second semester of my senior year was pretty stressful, wondering whether I still had a job. Um, I had been so fortunate to have started with them so early on that I always had this sense of confidence that immediately went away. Um, I was fortunate that I did still start. However, my start date was pushed back about two months. Um, and what I did then was just spent my time 
studying for my CPA exam, so I found some time to keep busy, but it was pretty stressful not starting until about October um, and knowing that I didn't really have much income either. So I can certainly appreciate the, the stress that you're feeling. And, um, you know, I, I would say, and we'll talk a little bit more about advice, but I would just try to remain calm and try to remain patient for sure. Hi everyone. So I will tell you that uh, for me, it was a challenge because I didn't know what exactly I wanted to, 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 do, to do next when I finished my undergraduate degree. So I actually finished my, uh, my bachelor's degree in December of 2008. And so for my last semester of uh, college, I actually had a full-time job at Carnegie Mellon University as a temporary employee in their university advancement division. And so when I finished my degree, I didn't know how, if I wanted to go to law school or go to grad school. So I had a lot to figure out, but I was fortunate in the sense that uh, my temporary job during my last semester at Pitt it became a full-time job in January of 2009. And so for the first couple of years, uh, just getting some solid work experience helped me to really figure out what I wanna do next. And I decided to, uh, to go ahead and pursue a master's degree uh, at Pitt School of Education. So if you don't have all the answers at this juncture, I think uh, it's okay. And like Renee said, uh, you know, be calm. Uh, I recommend that you try to, you know, reach out to uh, mentors um, as early as you can and start trying to build a support network uh, to help you uh, as you map out your next phase here. Chad? Yeah, I would say that um, I was certainly stressed out and anxious, um, like when they said, regarding just the uncertainty of it all, seeing it on the news every day that things were really bad economically didn't give me much encouragement that looking for a job after graduation was going to be uh, easy. Uh, but thankfully, um, I was uh, actually at the University of Pittsburgh campus, and I was very involved in the admissions office as a Pitt Pal uh, tour guide. And uh, thankfully, because of the relationships I built uh, on the campus and within that department, um, I was actually offered a temporary position uh, within the admissions office as an admissions counselor in charge of Allegheny County High Schools and uh, Washington DC High Schools uh, as a DC native. And so that one year position uh, ended up turning into three years total, but at least for that one year, I had something to um, be confident of, um, to kind of, you know, to have money for a little while until I was able to look for something else well. All right, so um, last but, probably least, but I had a uh, interesting story. So my junior summer, I worked for an investment bank. Uh, investment banks were kind of at the heart of everything that happened in 2008, 2009. Uh, so it was a hard job to get. It was my dream job. I had grinded. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a job offer. Uh, Pitt graduates early. So I graduated, let's call it April 28th. Uh, let's call it April 30th. Two days later, I'd gone through my entire senior year with a job in hand on top of the world. I got a call that said, you know, John, we love you, but we just lost $60 billion. We fired a third of our staff. Uh, now is not really the best time. So with that, they fortunately gave me uh, a retention bonus uh, that was enough and said, we'll see you in 12 months. So I was scheduled to get out of town for a little bit. Um, I went to Europe or I was planning on going to Europe a couple of weeks later. So I spent the two weeks before I left just panicking, calling everyone, calling every connection that I made on Wall Street. And I think some of you have probably seen this already, but in times of turbulence, phone lines that were once open are oftentimes shut. So all these great connections that I thought I had didn't really amount to a lot. And I'm panicked, you know, I really want to have certainty. I've worked so hard for four years to, to wind up in this job that was really interesting to me and nothing was working. So I go away on vacation for two weeks and I realize that everything's going to be okay. Um, and I think that that should be a theme of today is that you guys are going to be fine. Uh, you know, I appreciate it's stressful in the moment and, you know, we're sitting here gamefully employed, but you're going to be fine. Um, so basically they pushed me for 12 months. Uh, I had always worked every summer. I worked, you know, as much as I could, I worked during school. I'd never taken a minute to really take a step back and pause. So after that little vacation, I said, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to study for my CFA, which is, uh, 
a designation that would help in finance and I'm, I'm going to enjoy myself. Um, I had a few bucks to live on, which was nice. And so I started that plan. Uh, I was studying, I was, you know, taking, taking a little bit of time just to take a deep breath and kind of gather my thoughts. And three months later they called and said, can you start in two weeks? So it ended up working out for me. I had the same uh, path that I was on just with an extended summer. Um, but I think for me, it was, it was important to have that time to realize that that was still what I really wanted to do. And it was something that I wasn't really looking elsewhere. Um, I was one where I said, that's the path. And, and unfortunately, it lined back up for me. Great. Thank you. The next question is, if your path changed upon graduation or, um, and or what did you learn from this experience, from your experience between 2008 and 2010? Yeah, so, um, you know, like I said, my path didn't change aside from other than the fact that my, my start date did get pushed back. And I do think, though, had my offer been rescinded or had it been extended, I, I could see myself easily jumping into, well, I need to go to grad school because I need to do something that is still considered, you know, to be very high ranking that would still look very good but I, I don't think that that would have been the right decision for me um, I had gone back and forth when I had first started out at Pitt deciding whether I wanted to pursue a career in accounting or potentially go to law school so I do think that law school would have been really tempting for me um, but ultimately looking back I know that I am in the right place and um, so I, I guess I would just suggest not trying to make a rush decision. I think that John's example is, is very clear that if you just are patient and, and try to wait it out, that you will end up, you know, where, where you should be. But I mean, there, there's plenty of things to consider and, and grad school might be the right option for you, but I think you need to make sure that it's, it's the right investment at the right time. But that's where I think I would have gone had my path changed. And, and I don't know that that would have been the right answer for me. Andre? So uh, as I noted, I was really kind of confused when I finished my uh, undergraduate degree. I didn't know if I wanted to go to law school or go to grad school. So I was fortunate that I had that, uh, that temporary job at Carnegie Mellon University. And as Renee and John have alluded to, like taking a pause can be very helpful as you map out your next steps. And honestly, that transition from being a college student to being a working professional, that was a major transition. And it took me a year or two to get my footing, you know, as a working professional, but I'm very grateful for that experience and I learned so much. So if you have a chance to get some temporary experience in any field, uh, be open-minded and do great work because as I said, I was a temp, but I did good work and they hired me full time. So um, basically, you know, my takeaway, my answer to this question is take a pause if you can, uh, if you're trying to figure out your next steps, take a pause, reassess, um, and I, it will serve you well in the long term. Chad? Yeah, I would uh, piggyback on what Andre said. You know, the position that I got at Pitt was a temporary position, and because of the work that I did in that position, they offered me a full-time position, and I stayed there for the last for two more years on top of that year after graduating. And so, really, that decision solidified my path for the last 12 years because uh, everything I've done so far has been uh, kind of related to higher education advocacy, uh, primary violence prevention, and restorative justice. And it wouldn't have been but for that first temporary position that all of the uh, career experience I've had um, kind of was born out of that. And so I definitely um, recommend, you know, taking something temporary because you never know how that can actually create a path that you didn't know you would be on and that you didn't even plan. You know, I got my degree in psychology and I was, you know, a stage nerd. I was always acting and, and performing, and I thought I'd be, you know, the next Jamie Foxx. And while I'm still going towards those uh, those dreams, uh, that position helped me to be able to have sustainable income uh, for the last 12 years and kind of continue to uh, grow uh, professionally as a result. Sure. So, uh, as I alluded to earlier, I ended up staying on a similar path, but just with a delay. Uh, I, I will say, though, that, you know, 
I considered doing a handful of other things. And I think for you guys, you know, like Andre and Chad had mentioned, careers don't have to be linear. I don't think that your path has to be one that is entirely planned out just because, you know, you guys are, you know, candidly, you're 20, 21, 22 years old. You know, I didn't know anything then. I'm guessing you guys probably know more than I did, but I think that you don't have to have it all figured out right now. So let yourself do what Andre said and, and just, whatever you go about doing next, just take as much of it in as you can. Because I think, you know, having a diversity of experience benefits you. It, it gives you another talking point. As long as you can craft a narrative, not just say, you know, I did this, you know, because of X, you know, be able to explain why you did something. It doesn't have to be for money. It doesn't have to be for, you know, what you spent the last four years studying. If it's something where you can learn or make a couple bucks or parlay it into something else. I, I think having, uh, the attitude of I'm going to learn no matter what I'm doing. And, and hopefully it's something that it does interest you, but if it doesn't just squeeze it for as much as it's worth. Great. Thank you all. Cont and a reminder to use the question and answer portion. If you have additional questions at the end, we will ask those. The next question that we have is, so looking back, what is one thing you would do differently if faced with a similar situation today? like our class of 20 grads are dealing with? Yeah, I think um, what, now this will be really easy for me to say, but <laughs> I think I would have tried to be less stressed out. Um, I think that John pointed out, you guys will all be fine. And, and I feel confident in saying that. Um, if, you, if you look at us all now, we're 10 years out and, and we're, all doing, we're all doing great. So um, if you can try to, again, take a pause and try not to be that stressed out. It's really not that productive. Um, do things like networking where you can, um, research what other opportunities could be out there if maybe you did have a job offer that, that's no longer um, available to you. And try something temporary because it could turn into something permanent. Um, you know, I think that one thing in hindsight the, the process and the uncertainty that I had going into starting my job has made me more thankful for the job that, that I still have, um, you know, 10 and a half years later. So I do think that there is a benefit to having an appreciation for being able to have a job as well. So trying to keep perspective, trying to remain positive, and, and as much as you can, try not to let the uncertainty stress you out. That's what I would have done differently. <laughs> Andre? Yes. So I would say that uh, I was very fortunate that when I entered the workforce uh, that there were many people who took a liking to me and they gave me good advice and great professional tips. Uh, looking back, I would have been more proactive with seeking out mentors because as I mentioned, you know, that transition from being a college student to being in the workforce, it's a big transition. And frankly, there are just some things that you don't know until you're in the workforce for a while, but having mentors can accelerate your growth and make you uh, go further, faster. So I would have been more proactive with seeking mentors. And I will tell you, I'm 34 years old right now. At this point in my career, I reach out to colleagues all the time and say, hey, I admire you. I admire your work. Can I take you out for coffee to pick your brain and get some advice? So I would encourage you to be proactive with you know, seeking mentors and building a support network. Chad? Yeah, I definitely would. Uh would agree that networking mentorship is something that's very valuable in fact you know your relationships can be a type of currency that can be more fruitful than money and because it can really pay a return on investment in the long run uh, if it was something i could do differently um, probably would have tried to put some of my discretionary money that i had at the time into investments because at that time things were a lot cheaper <laughs> because of the crash and so every time i look at the stock market you know, obviously right now things are volatile, but at that time, there were things that if I had purchased it then, 12 years later, I would have had uh, quite a bit of a pretty nice investment. So, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't even have to be that much. It could be, you know, you can look for things that are um, fairly reasonable. You know, instead of going to Taco Bell, maybe put that money towards, you know, an investment. So that would be the only thing I could think of is just maybe find ways that you can invest a little bit, save a little bit and make sure that you really foster and, and kind of nurture those uh, those relationships with people, mentors, anyone who might be able to help you down the long run. Right, 
so I'll, I'll echo the, the last few points that I think from the relationship building standpoint, that, that's massive. That's how I got my job. That's how I've uh, been able to get pretty much everything in my life. I, I haven't often gone in the, you know, the, the traditional path. I've tried to you know, get to most of the places via personal connections. And I'll say two things on that. So one, try to reach out to people without an ask uh, as often as you can. It doesn't always have to be, you know, can you help me with this? Can you do this for me? Um, you know, just update people on your situation. I think people are more empathetic than ever these days. Um, now, certainly some people aren't going to be uh, and don't get discouraged, but I think, you know, telling your story, people appreciate it. You know, you guys have better air cover than anyone's ever had for not having a job. Everyone understands it right now. We just lost 30 million jobs in the country. So for some of you guys not having one, it's fine. This isn't a big black mark on your resume. Um, so, you know, just tell people, Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. If you think that there's anything, uh, of interest, uh, I want to do this, but if you think that is better, you know, I I'm open to good opportunity. Um, uh, so I think being open and just reaching out to people and then also, you know, try and be in the driver's seat with following up with people. Um, you know, if someone doesn't, respond to an email, don't be discouraged, you know, just get back in touch. Um, now you want to do it tactfully. You don't want to be, you know, knocking on someone's door when they've got bigger things to worry about. You know, if you're talking to people that are very senior and they're worried about bringing their people back to work or the health and safety, give them a break too, but also follow up. People appreciate persistence. So I think that that's one thing I would have done more of back then is, you know, just keeping relationships uh, alive as much as possible. You know, one email is great. One back and forth is great, but try and keep those relationships going because people are willing. You know, I think flattery is really important and telling someone like Chad said, you know, Hey, I like what you're doing. What you do is really interesting. Uh, Andre saying he reaches out to people all the time now in the middle part of his career, you know, People are willing if you say what you've done is something that I really respect and want to do. That's a good start. People love talking about themselves. So I'd, I'd enter conversations with that in mind. Thank you. The next question is, how did your pit experience help? So learning, networking, any other experiences, Renee? Yeah. So. Um, while I was at Pitt, I think it goes back to this tenet of networking and building relationships. That was always something that I had done and that was highly encouraged, particularly in the business school. And so um, I felt comfortable when I was stressed out or uncertain, you know, talking to my peers about their experiences that they were having, um, trying to help each other out, but then also having those conversations with the people at Deloitte that were, um, that were still employed there and um, that could help me to transition and help me have more clarity into my situation. I felt completely comfortable with my network because of the um, skills that I had learned at Deloitte or at Pitt for Deloitte. Uh, Andre? So Renee, I want to piggyback off you. I think uh, the skill sets that you earn with your PIT degree are just uh, incredible and they are transferable to so many different professions. And uh, one of the highlights of my time at Pitt was doing uh, research as an undergraduate. And so I had a chance to work with a uh, faculty member on a project, a political science faculty member, and just that experience of enhancing my, my research skills, my writing skills, my public speaking skills, uh, those skill sets are skills that I use every single day. So uh, basically the skill sets that I earned from Pitt uh, help me and continue to help me uh, in my life and uh, my career. Chad? Yeah, I got so many skill sets from being a, a Pitt student. Uh, you know, from being an actor, I was able to get mentored by Dr. Benel Lilly, who recently passed away, but you know, is iconic in Pittsburgh theater. And uh, my professor, Dr. Shrum, uh, I was able to get letters of recommendations for various uh, uh, job opportunities that I was trying to get. So that was always helpful. Um, also, just the work that I did in the admissions office allowed me to get work in D.C. and uh, D.C. public school system, helping students get into college and get the money they need to go, uh, as well as the mentorship that I would later do, uh, working with young men, teaching them about healthy masculinity and uh, ways they can be strong without being violent. And when I was on campus, I actually started a men against sexual violence club on campus. So a lot of the things that I did in extracurricular ended up becoming um, kind of like income revenue building uh, opportunities for me uh, later on. So definitely take into consideration ways that you can even turn things that you might have done when you were in a club um, or as part of a team um, into uh, some sort of 
right. So uh, I'll give one piece of very practical advice. Read the book Range by David Epstein. So what this talks about is uh, early specialization is a bad thing. Uh, so basically all of us rush into these careers and try and just run down one really narrow path. And what this book talks about, uh, and it's been really good for me justifying going to business school kind of in the middle of my career and leaving what I had done for 10 years, talks about the fact that people that have uh, a breadth of skills tend to reach higher heights. Um, so I think that that's important to remember versus just running down one very narrow path and saying that this is the only thing I'm willing to do. Now, if, you, if you're someone that finds that one love, that's great. But basically just be willing to, to do a couple of different things. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the people on this call have highlighted the fact that what they're doing today is the benefit of and the result of something that they didn't intend on doing originally. So I think that that's, you know, you have to be willing to let yourself go down these paths that maybe you didn't think about six months ago. Uh, And then, you know, part two is, again, it's easy to say, but, you know, take a deep breath, you're going to be fine. You know, you've got a degree from a great school. Uh, If you don't get something, you know, in the next week, in the next month, you know, that's okay. Um, be thoughtful with your decisions. And, you know, I, I think that people have talked about grad school. It's a big cost. Um, you know, I, I I'm recently just paid a lot of it. And I think that, you know, be sure it's something that you really want to do before you sign up to spend two years or a year or however many years of your life pursuing something that was just the only option on the table at the time. Um, so I would just, I would caution you against doing something prematurely that has net outflows instead of inflows. Great, thank you. And thank you for the questions. We have one one more question before we get to the two that, or the few that have been submitted. So what advice do you have for the class of 2020? So we've all said this a few times, but definitely stay proactive. The fact that you're participating in an event like this is great. Um, You're definitely taking all the the right steps. I think that in your time that maybe is a little bit of downtime right now, think about how you can um, take what you've learned now and use that in job interviews. So um, right now, a lot of people are working remotely still. And I think that there is, there will certainly be opportunities that you might start your job working remote. So Think about what you've learned in college, what you've done in your group projects, that you already have a lot of skills to work virtually. And just make sure as you're preparing for your interviews that you're thinking about how to weave those examples in like right off the bat, because that will be really helpful for um, the people like us that aren't necessarily used to working remotely to just know that you're going to transition into that um, right away. And then also just think of how this experience overall has really helped you develop resilience. I was interviewing someone for um, an internship and she had been abroad um, at the beginning of the semester. And so while she was telling me about that, I mean, she really strongly conveyed how in 48 hours her whole world was turned upside down and she had to pack, get home, deal with that. And, And to me, that showed that she could really deal with stress she could handle difficult situations. And um, I found it to be a, a really compelling story in her interview. So try as best as you can to reflect on the past few months and think about how you could then use that whenever you get um, a job interview so you're prepared for that. So I will say that I know that all of you are smart and capable. And so my two pieces of advice would be number one, try to have some fun right now because I know that this is a stressful time. And the second thing is, I am the president of the Chesapeake and Potomac Pit Club. And so we offer alumni programming and events for alum, Pit alumni in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. If you can uh, join the Pit Club or council in your uh, area, because that's another support uh, system for you. And uh, our Pit Club, it's a great outlet for stress for me because we have game watches and we uh, have uh, social networking events. And so it's a great outlet. And uh, the Pitt alumni in this region, they are heavy hitters in their fields. And so you never know who you'll meet if you participate in those club events. So have fun and join your Pitt club or Pitt council. Chad? Yeah, I would say, you know, try to stay calm and try to be uh, strategic, you know, because you're catching up to your future self regardless. 
And one of my favorite quotes by Denzel Washington is, true desire in the heart for anything good is God's proof to you sent beforehand to indicate that it's yours already. So you can truly manifest what you want uh, if you really have a plan. And, you know, luck is the residue of design. So you have to just make sure that you're actually thinking about, think about what your elevator pitch is, think about writing your cover letter for a job that you haven't even uh, heard about yet. You know, what, what is your dream job? Write your cover letter. I've been tweaking my cover letter for the last 10 years, and i got to say it's pretty good because it gets better and better. So um, just keep on tweaking and, and working on making yourself sound good because you are your own brand, and so you can really kind of sharpen it and reframe yourself uh, every moment we sit down and, and, and do that. I don't have a lot of wisdom left after everything that's already been said, but uh, the one thing I'd say uh, in kind of in addition to what Andre talked about, about, you know, you're all smart, you're all capable. When you do have these conversations that can be a little bit more live, just be likable. Uh, I can't tell you how important that is, especially right now when people are stressed and people are, you know, worried about the health of their business, the health of their family, their personal wealth, all these things. They don't want to sit next to someone that, is painful to be around. So, you know, be friendly, be human, uh, talk about them, understand them, understand why they're doing the job that they're doing. Don't just be transactional. And I, I think that that's something that uh, you're going to see successful people reiterating time and time again, that you have to, you have to be likable, uh, make good first impressions, you know, be energetic, I think just wanting to be there is a good thing. Being smart, wanting to work hard, these are all good things, but also just be, be a good person. Um, and, and that oftentimes can be a differentiator. Great, thank you so much. And we have a couple questions that have been asked, so I'm gonna go into those now. So is now a time where we can negotiate our salaries or should we accept the initial offer? So I have some perspective on this. I think the first thing that you should always think about when negotiating a salary is doing the, the research to understand if that's appropriate in the industry or not. Some, it, it is not appropriate to go in um, negotiating salary. So I, I would be mindful of that. But I will tell you a story of someone that I graduated with. Um, he had interned as part of the university at Pitt through all four of his years. He really wanted to stay working there, but they didn't have a position for him full-time. He had accepted a position um, at a regional accounting firm, but his offer also got deferred. And I think to the point where it was deferred until November, December. Um, so he had stayed in his internship throughout the summer and the accounting firm had offered to pay for his CPA exam, to pay for his, um, uh, the materials to study for his CPA exam. So he just kept working at his internship while, while he was working there, um, a position opened up. And so he ended up keeping his job at Pitt because the other firm couldn't actually provide when he was gonna start. But then he was able to negotiate for them to pay for all of his, for Pitt to pay for his CPA exam, his CPA exam materials and kind of make whole. Um, and then also he was able to get um, funding for his MBA, which was something that he ultimately wanted to do. So that was certainly appropriate to negotiate in the time and in his circumstances that he did that. So I think that there are certainly circumstances where you could do that, but I would, um, I would hesitate depending on the industry, but I'd be open to other perspectives as well. I um I agree. I think it's circumstantial. You know, I tend to think that in business as in life, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. And so it's sometimes it's important to exert your value uh, through that type of conversation. But I think it's also, you know, like when they say circumstantial, I mean, it depends on where you live too, you know, what, what the cost of living is and what you actually need versus um, what you want. You know, when I got my first position at Pitt, they paid me like 22 or 23,000 a year, which was at that time the most I have ever made. Uh, that would be really, really uh, 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 a bad situation for me now if I had that salary. And then the second job that I got was in Washington, D.C., where the cost of living is higher. 
And I didn't negotiate because when they told me that it was double what I made at Pitt, I said, oh, I'll take it, you know? So it was just the nature of it being at a place that was a cost of living. And of course, I learned that when I, when, when I started making that amount and with the cost of living, that it was all proportionate. So, but it did allow for uh, me to continue for each job going forward to raise the bar for what I was willing to, um, to accept. So, you know, if, if, it's, if it's the difference between making nothing and making something, I'd always go with something over nothing. Uh, but uh, like Renee say, depending on where you are and depending on what you need, and depending on the industry, uh, it doesn't hurt to uh, inquire. Yeah, one thing I'll say is that for a lot of jobs, they want you to ask. So if you're doing something in business, something in sales, something that requires, you know, some type of representing your firm and you're not negotiating, at least asking, uh, it's, probably a, it's probably a knock on you. So I think that it doesn't hurt, uh, but I wouldn't negotiate until I had an offer in hand. Get an offer in hand first and then ask the question. And the worst they're going to say is no. Um, so I, I think that that's important. And I also think that, you know, while you know, negotiating right now might seem like, Hey, you know, I'd rather make, you know, $2,000 more, $5,000 more, whatever the number is. That's those dollar amounts probably aren't going to change your lifestyle. So don't get too hung up on it if it's the right job and it's just marginally off. Now, if it's, if it's an unsustainable amount of uh, income, that's different. But if you think you can make it work and it's something you want to do, don't get hung up on the dollar figure your first year out. You know, that, that number is going to go up a lot. You're all going to be fine from that front. So um, try and optimize for longer term. And that means optimizing for personal growth and development and, and learning and, and a path that you want to be on rather than just a salary in, in four weeks. Great. And our next question is a lot of us are used to doing a lot of lot to learn, doing a lot to learn a lot as a result of being active in school and organizations with extracurriculars. What advice do you have for taking care of mental health with their transition to a more limited freedom to take part in those learning experiences? I can, I can kick us off if others want a minute to think. So, you know, I think, listen, it's school. So I just finished two years of school and it was, it was pretty busy. I think what you're forgetting, depending on the job, is that if you're employed in a, you know, a job that 80% of us have, once you go home, you might be able to turn it off for a little bit. And then you have total freedom to you know, pursue those extracurriculars and your passions and you know, hobbies, whatever else. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think of it as, you know, college is over, all my freedom is over. You can almost argue that you have as much time. You just have to be thoughtful about it and intentional with your time. You know, I wouldn't just sit around and, you know, watch Netflix for three hours like you could in college because, you know, not attending class, it might not matter. Um, and then I would just say that, you know, you probably also can't say yes to everything like you can at school. You know, it's not like there's a you know, a club fair where you just walk around in, in, in the professional life and say yes to everything. You don't have enough time. Um, so just be thoughtful. And yeah, I would say yes more often than I would say no. Uh, you know, you can always sleep when you're older. I would, I would have as much fun as you can, do as many things as you can, and um, be willing to not stretch yourself thin, but be willing to, to try as many things as you're willing to and as, as you have time for. But, you know, your life isn't over. It's not like you all of a sudden have no hours in the day. So I would call that a, I would call that a, a false pretense around working life. I would say take seriously your leisure time as much as your work time. You know, uh, don't take your leisure time for granted. Even when I was a student at Pitt, I would have my things to do list, which would include, you know, a five page paper that I had to write, but also a movie that I wanted to see. And I would cross off the movie in the same way that I would cross off the uh, assignment because I saw them as both uh, important to my overall well-being. So, uh, you know, whatever, you know, I, maybe use a things to do list and, and divide it between the things that you know is necessary for, for your, your uh, you know, your bottom line with regards to, you know, your career or your, your bank account. But then also for your morale, like write down things that is important to you that uh, is fun.
fun that you enjoy and and then cross off cross it off after you do it um treat it as if it is worthy of your time and importance because it is and i want to add to chats i think you know planning out your leisure time is critically important. And so, you know, I participate in the pit club here in DC, but I also, you know, I read a lot. Um, I, I try to get out and walk and run when I can. So mapping out your leisure time is critically important. So be sure to do that. Yeah, and I would say um, we're all participating in this right now and it's in the middle of a standard work day, right? Um, you know, maybe not everybody is, is working right now, but having you can still have flexibility and participate in the things that interest you even during the work day as well provided that you know you block your calendar or make sure that it's okay with with your employer that you're participating and things like that but i wouldn't even think of the confines of you know the the morning to evening work day to find ways to to still do things that are important to you um, that are important to your well-being and that interests you as well. Great, thank you. And the next question we have is any advice for avoiding burnout? I think the last question <laughs> it would be my advice is to make sure that you are taking time to do things that are important to you and that interest you and that give you energy. Um, and it doesn't have to be something necessarily that's you know the most fun thing that you've ever done in the in the whole world um i never did a lot of um running or cycling or anything when i was um, at pit i just kind of ran around and somehow didn't need to specifically exercise but you will start to learn that when you start working um that goes away so there are things too that you just need to find that helps you get like some type of mental release as well and, and making time to do those for sure. When it comes to the workplace, there's an acronym that I really like called BART, B-A-R-T. And it stands for boundaries, authority, role, and task. And I think that being cognizant of your boundaries, staying within your lane, knowing how much authority you have compared to others, not deauthorizing yourself, but authorizing yourself when appropriate, knowing what your role is and knowing what your tasks are compared to others will allow you to uh, avoid burnout as well. Because when you're not a, a, when you are not really conscious of those things, you can end up kind of overextending yourself in ways that are not necessary and not attached to your authority, not attached to your role uh, or your task, and you're making yourself go out of bounds. So uh, boundary, authority, role, and task, I would say keep those things in mind when working in order to avoid burnout. Here's one other thing, just I think uh, burnout can also just be uh, something that you mentally prep against. So uh, what I mean by that is, you know, you guys have had four years of school, maybe some of you have had longer or some of you have rushed through it and finished early, but you guys have been in school, you've been prepping to start a job, um, you know, provide some productivity and help the help the greater world, right? So if you have to work a lot, I guarantee everyone on this call has had late nights, early mornings. It's okay, you'll be fine. So I would just say, you know, um, burnout is something that you want to guard against. But if you have to work a lot and you have to grind and it's it's tiring and you've got bags under your eyes, you know, try and remember that that's a privilege because you've got a good job that requires that. And a lot of people have jobs that are just really easy. Um, and if it's a job that's going to burn you out, it probably means that it's hard. So look at that as something that, you know, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to have a hell of a story on the other side and it's going to be a bonding thing. You know, I look at the people that had jobs that I used to have on wall street and they, you know, they used to work a lot. You know, we used to work, you know, all hours of the night, and that's something that, you know, now it says something about you. So if you did a job where you potentially burn out and you survived and you're sane, it probably means that you're pretty tough. Um, and I would also just say, just, you know, as a personal point, have something to look forward to on your calendar. So, you know, have whether it's, you know, at the end of the week, uh, end of the month or, you know, hey, I, I can't wait until, you know, Thanksgiving. Uh, just have something to look forward to because that mentally does a lot for you. I also want to just add that there are ways that maybe one can do their job more efficiently. So always trying to learn new skill sets while on the job can actually help maybe complete tasks quicker, uh, more efficiently, uh, smarter, 
and in a way that actually can help avoid burnout as well. So, you know, I remember when I worked in high schools as a, as a college counselor, um, I really used Excel spreadsheets a lot to help me to organize the data in a way that made the work on the, on the back end easier in the long run uh, compared to my colleagues who didn't understand how to use those, uh, you know, that, that application for them to make their work easier. So they ended up being more stressed out about, you know, how, figuring out how to sift through this data than I was. So just learning how to increase your aptitude with regards to different skill sets that's related to your job can help with burnout because you end up being more efficient when you're completing the task. Great, thank you. That is all the questions that we have. So I wanted to again, thank you, Renee, Andre, Chad, and John. I also wanna remind um, those who are joining us that we are continuing these webinars. The next one is Wednesday, May 27th. So tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's bold and creative networking during COVID-19. And then we will also have one on Tuesday, June 2nd at 1 p.m., which is building and leveraging your network. So we appreciate everyone's time and thank you for joining us. Be safe, stay healthy, and hail to pit. Hail to pit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone.